We're so glad you're here this morning. As as, uh, Chris mentioned, we're wrapping up today our study on the book of Galatians. Normally, I would encourage you to open your Bibles, but I'm telling, shut your, turn your, close your Bibles. Close your Bibles. John, close your Bible. This is a closed book test. Where did open book tests ever come from? When I was a kid, walking uphill to school five miles each way in the snow, we had closed book tests. There was no such thing as an open book test. Am I right? All right. Closed book. Here we go. Quiz time. We're going to start easy. Who wrote the book of Galatians? Way to go. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) Finish this sentence. We know that a person is not justified by well done or works of the law, but through excellent, excellent. First service, so much dumber than you. (laughs) Question number three, which, which best describes Paul's attitude toward the Galatians? Warm fuzzies, parental pride, cold indifference, or astonished frustration? D, excellent. Well done. Question four, who did Paul oppose to his face in the city of Antioch? Well, oh yeah, there's a little, there's a little lighter. Peter. Yeah, it was Peter. You got it. You're good. All right, final jeopardy. What two words, and I'm giving you, they both start with the letter F, reveal the predominant theme of Galatians. Two words. Faith and well, well done. Excellent. All right. Take home essay, Greg. (laughs) Answer the question in chapter 3, verse 21. Is the law contrary to the promises of God? Five pages, MLA formatted, cite all references. (laughs) Have them on my desk by next Sunday. (laughs) You think I'm kidding? (laughs) All right. Let's do, however, review the book of Galatians. And we're going to try to be quick, but as thorough as possible. This is a critically important letter. The first letter in our New Testaments that Paul wrote, somewhere around the year 48 AD. You might recall, if you've been here, that the first four chapters of Galatians, we looked very carefully at our faith, or more appropriately, appropriately, we looked at the faith. Paul was keen on making sure that we understand the content of the faith. And it starts at the very beginning, chapter 1. Now you can open up your Bibles. Yeah, chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. There's this, this brief little synopsis of the gospel right there. That's the faith. That Jesus Christ gave himself for us to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God our Father means it's a plan from eternity past to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Chapter 3, verse 13. Another one of these just almost the gospel in a sentence. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. On the cross, as it goes on to say, for it is written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree, meaning the cross. The passage that I encourage you to to memorize in chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, when the fullness of time had come, Christ or God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we would receive adoption as sons, or I think we can say sons and daughters. So Paul, throughout the letter, sprinkles in the content of the faith. But we've also seen in the the book of Galatians, Paul contending for the faith, or what he terms in chapter 2 twice, the truth of the gospel. The first occasion is when he goes to the city of Jerusalem, a private meeting. The Spirit revealed to him that he needs to go to Jerusalem, and he takes with him a young Gentile convert named Titus, And it's decided that Titus should not be circumcised, which 
upsets some of the Jewish leaders there. And we read in chapter two, let me get back in verse uh, four, because of the false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ so that we might so that they might bring us back into slavery. To them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. If on that occasion, in that time, in that place, if Paul dictated to Titus that he should be circumcised before meeting with the leaders in Jerusalem, it would have sent the wrong message. The truth of the gospel would have been at stake. Later on in chapter 2, that's the occasion of Paul and Peter confronting them, uh, Paul confronting Peter. Peter comes up to Antioch in the province of Syria from Jerusalem. He eats and he has fellowship with Gentile believers. But as soon as some other leaders from Jerusalem come up to Antioch, Peter distances himself from these, uh, from these Gentile Christians. And Paul said, the truth of the gospel is at stake in your behavior. You are leading people astray, Peter. And so he confronts him with it. Then we made the remarkable discovery that Paul said that you and I today in Gardner, Kansas, in the year 2021, you and I are descendants of Abraham through faith. Chapter 3, verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. A remarkable statement considering the people he's writing to are of a complete different ethnicity. But by faith, we are descendants of Abraham. Now, we've gotten the, the sense in, as we've read the book of Galatians, as you've read it and maybe reread it and reviewed it, you, you, you see that Paul is as direct and, and um, maybe even confrontational as he is in any other letter. He minces no words. It's not as though he does not love the people he's writing to. I think he loves them deeply, cares for them immensely, but he cares even more for the truth of the gospel. And so he speaks very directly, and we see that again from the very beginning. Chapter 1, verse 6, I'm astonished, or I can't believe that you, that you are deserting him who called you by grace. How can you do that? Chapter 3, verse 1, who has bewitched you? Or who's pulled the wool over your eyes? You don't, you don't get this in many other letters of Paul. And then the climax of, of, of this astonished disappointment is chapter 4, 11, right? I, I, I'm afraid for you. I feel like I've wasted my time with you. Confused exasperated, deeply concerned. Paul's like a, a, a coast guardsman who's been called out to the raging seas and he's, he's in peril himself, hanging from a helicopter, throwing a life preserver to someone who says, no thanks, I think I'll, I think I'll swim into shore. No, you can't. And, he, and, 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 and it's like Paul saying, I'm, I'm trying to protect you. I'm trying to save you from bondage in your faith. And some of the Galatians say, no, we're, we're fine, we're good. Now, again, I say he, I would contend that he felt all this confusion and concern precisely because he loved them and because he understood the implications of the faith, not only towards salvation, but also in our sanctification, in our growing in the faith. Because Paul says, faith is not just a dry, dour doctrine it, it, it stirs the heart. And thus in chapter 5, verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That's, that, it, just, it just keeps getting better and better, the gospel. Consequently, as frustrated as Paul was with the Galatians, his harshest criticism was reserved for those who were twisting the faith and leading people out of freedom back into bondage. These teachers, or as we saw in chapter 5, it seemed as though there was a predominant spokesman of these teachers, were telling the Galatians that in order to be saved, the men had first to be circumcised, the rest had to follow other rites and rituals. To them, Paul would say, I wish you would emasculate yourselves. 
Harsh words, but there's a point. Because one test, and, and there, are, there are others, I grant you, but one test of discerning whether someone is teaching the faith is whether or not their teaching brings freedom or if it brings bondage. Does your heart soar at the good news or does it sink from impossible expectations? Now, I have, it, it, it seems at times contrary with his, with his wording that, that he does love them, but we have to, again, I, I think that in order to make sure that we understand this book well, we need to see where it came from. Last week, I encourage you to go back and read Romans 7 and 8 and see if, 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 if the, the end of Galatians 5 made more sense to you. This week, I would encourage you, go back and read Acts 13 and 14 again. This is the establishment of these very people that Paul is writing to in Acts 13 and 14. Paul and his friend Barnabas are in Antioch in Syria. You see that on, to the, to the uh, east. The Holy Spirit sets them apart, sets them on mission. They are, they are excited about going and traveling and sharing and spreading the good news. And so after making a stop on the island of Cyprus, they make their way up to the southern province, the southern area of Galatia, the province of Galatia, and they start with another city named Antioch in Pisidia. And there they preach the gospel. They start in the Jewish synagogue, as, the, as Paul always did. And after preaching in the Jewish synagogue, people were interested. They wanted to hear more, and so he gave them more. And we don't know exactly how long he was there, but he was there long enough for some of the Jew Jewish leaders, in Luke's words in the book of Acts, that they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas in Antioch. We don't know what form it took, but it's, 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 it's plain enough that it's persecution. All right? So they decide they're going to leave Antioch and they're going to go to Iconium. So they make their way from west to east and they go to Iconium. And there they preach again the gospel among the Jews first. And, and, and the Jewish leaders in Iconium have in mind to stone Paul. But they find out about the plot. And so they leave Iconium before it can be carried out. And so they go to Lystra. This is all now in, in, in Acts 14. They get to Lystra. Well, by this time, the disgruntled Jews in Antioch and Iconium do catch up with them in Lystra, and they do stone Paul, presuming, thinking they've, they've left him for dead. But there's, if you read the account, it's just great. They stone him. They think he's dead. The disciples, these new Christians gather around Paul, and he gets up, and he goes back into town. I'd like to think he actually beat the ones who stoned him back into town. They kind of wave at him on the, on the way back into town. He thought you killed me. Ha uh ha. -huh. But he gets up and I, by the power of God. Well, he can take a hint. So he goes on to Derby. He moves on to the, to the city of Derby. And there he, again, he preaches the gospel. And then guess what he does? He retraces his steps. He goes right back into the fire and everyone, he goes from Derby back to Lystra, back to Iconium, back to Antioch, doing what? Well, that's what we have in Acts 14, verse 22. Did I have that scripture on there? I can't remember. But listen, Acts 14, 22. He goes back, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many trials, we must enter the kingdom of God. In other words, it's, it's going to happen to you. It doesn't come without a cost. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. It's a great, it's a great story. And, and all of this, okay, all of this, while Paul says in chapter 4, 13 in Galatians that he had a bodily ailment. He wasn't even at 100%. We don't know what the bodily ailment was. It's been conjectured that it was something that had to do with his eyesight because he writes later that they, the Galatians would have gouged out their own eyes and given them to Paul if they could. It seems logical, but we don't know. But he had a bodily ailment going through all this, preaching, teaching, discipling, suffering, traveling, so that he would say at the end of this letter, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. 
So he earned the right to address these churches directly and forcefully. I think we can give that to him. And now before the letter ends, and you always kind of get the feeling that Paul could say more, he offers a final exhortation and a final invitation. And that what, that's what we read this morning. At the end of this letter, chapter 6, let's begin reading at verse 6. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let's not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand? It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised don't themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. In other words, they're, 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 they're counting score. They're, they're keeping tabs. They're, they're marking notches for all their converts. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble. For I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Let's pray. Again, Father, with our Bibles open, this gift of yours to your children, we pray that your spirit would guide us, that we would see wonderful things in your word, learn how to apply them and live them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So a final exhortation. We've said before that the job of a shepherd is to expound the scripture, which Paul has done with them, but also to exhort the church. And that's what Paul is doing here in the latter part of this letter. His final exhortation first centers around teachers and those who are taught. It's about the teachers and those who are taught. Now, verse 6 is one of those verses that seems a little disjointed. We just read about bearing one another's burdens, fulfilling the law of Christ, We've read about kind of spiritual pride. Anyone who thinks they're something, if they're nothing, deceives himself. We've talked about, or Paul writes about, we should test our work. We're going to stand on our own before judgment. I, I'm responsible for me. You're responsible for you. I'm not responsible for you. I'm responsible to you. And then all of a sudden, he just says, let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. And it seems a little disjointed. But again, if you remember that the previous paragraph is about how to walk in the Spirit as a community, it makes sense that Paul would say something about the relationship in the community, the important relationship in the community between teacher and those who are taught. And I think we can safely assume that Paul is referring to those men that he and Barnabas appointed as elders in the churches before leaving Galatia, that they are the teachers. And to them, they have a responsibility that they are to teach the word. Now, when Paul says, or when, when, we, when we hear him saying that they are to teach, and we can assume it's, it's, it's the word, it's, it's not the, they didn't have the blessing we had. They, this is a letter that they received. This is the first letter of Paul's. They don't, they don't have Ephesians, they don't have Romans, they don't have any other letter. But they are to teach. And Paul would write to church leaders later that they are to teach the word. He would tell Timothy, tell your elders, teach the word. He would tell Titus, elders should teach the word. In fact, he tells Titus, who's on the island of Crete with these brand new churches, if when you come to the point of appointing elders, this elder, chapter 1, verse 9, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. 
so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. You can kind of read between the lines. You can kind of hear Paul saying, I've been through this before. (laughs) I went through this with the very first churches I established. And it takes strong teachers grounded in the word to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, again, what are they teaching? Well, I'm not doubting that they have the Old Testament scriptures, but I don't think that's all that Paul means by this. If you'll remember at the very beginning of the church, (laughs) Acts chapter 2, the very first Christians, they're coming to faith by the thousands. And what do they do? Acts 2.42, they gather themselves together on a regular basis and among other things, they commit themselves to what? The apostles' teaching. And what are the apostles teaching? I think they're teaching the words of Jesus. They spent three years with him. That, That was not three wasted years. And so the apostles are passing on what Jesus taught them. And the, and the apostles are passing on to church leaders. And there's, it's like, you're now responsible to pass that on. That's, that's 2, Peter, or 2 Timothy 2, 2. What you've heard from me, entrust to reliable men who will who'll share it with others. That's, that's the, the cyclical part of all this. So he's teaching them, or telling the teachers, the elders, to teach the word. Now, I guess the bottom line, we don't have specific dates for how long Paul's travels were in each city. I'm sure Luke does some condensing. But in that time, Paul had enough time to not only share the gospel, but as Luke recorded, as we to strengthen them, disciple them in the word. And so he appoints elders, men in whom he saw a godly character as well as a grasp on teaching. And their teaching would benefit the community. And we know it did because here we are, folks, 2,000 years later, and the cycle continues. That leaders teach the word to others who can teach the word to others who can teach the word. We're here because of that. But the church then has an obligation in order to preserve the community. And their obligation, Paul says, is to share their resources or in his words, share all good things. Now, what does that mean? It could mean that church members need to share insights they've gained as a result of a teacher's teaching. It could mean that that, that the community needs to share experiences that validate the teacher's teaching. Or just to voice simple appreciation for the teacher's teaching. All valid, all good, all needed. When a teacher teaches, he'd like to know that what he's doing is having an effect. But probably what Paul means here is the principle of a church community taking care of the teacher's physical needs or financial support. So Jesus would say in his ministry that a laborer deserves his wages. And with that phrase, Paul tells Timothy, again, another one of his sons in the faith, When talking about church life, he says this in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. In the very next verse, he would say, as Scripture scripture says, don't muzzle the ox while he treads the grain and let the laborers be compensated for their given wages for their labors. All right, so we also, have, we also have another passage, 1 Corinthians 9, 14. Paul writes, in the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. If you've ever wondered why we do things the way we do here or any other church that you may be, for that matter, you've been a part of, why is there a, a staff of, of, of pastors or leaders who get paid? These are rationales for that. Now, you also may recall that Paul chose not to receive compensation for his work in the gospel. What's up with that? He was a a leather worker. He made tents, which is a very hot commodity in the first century. And so he was able to make his living that way. Unlike Paul, I have no other skills. (laughs) 
I mean none. I'm serious. I don't have skills. I'm as handy as a foot. So from the bottom of my heart, and I mean this sincerely, thank you for supporting me. Because I don't know what else I'd do. And it's also not lost on me that this text comes up on the day we vote for the budget. <laughs> I'm calling that providential. You can do with it what you want. So first exhortation about teachers and the taught. Second exhortation is, as you, you look in the text, you can just see, it's about sowing and reaping. Speaking of not having skills, but I at least have enough knowledge to know that you don't plant wheat seeds and expect corn, right? It is an absolute principle that you reap what you sow. Yet, in life, people live contrary to this principle. Even people who call themselves Christians. In Paul's words, they're deceived, or more accurately, they've deceived themselves. And worse, they try to make God out to be a liar. As they want to live however they want, but expect a different harvest. Live as much as they want for themselves. Sow seeds of the flesh, but reap a harvest of the Spirit. And Paul says, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in the physical realm. It doesn't work that way in the spiritual realm. You reap what you sow. So Paul can't be any clearer. Seeds of the flesh reap corruption. Seeds of the Spirit reap eternal life. Live in sexual immorality, envy, division, jealousy, idolatry. Live in that and you will reap destruction in your life. When harvest time comes, that's your harvest, destruction. On the other hand, Sow seeds of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, and you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So if the community of faith wants to reap the blessing of eternal life, it will and it must persistently and patiently do good. I just love the simplicity of verse 9. Let's not grow weary of doing good. What's that mean? What do you think it means? <laughs> just do good things. But he adds, we will reap what we sow but this harvest may come slowly. It may be years before the prodigal returns. It may mean walking through hardships and trauma for the seeds of the Spirit to reap a harvest. But just as surely as at the proper time God's sending forth His Son, Paul says, in due season, we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Visions of, or memories of Jesus' parable of Mark 4 come to mind. The sower who just has a bag of seeds and he's just throwing seed out seemingly indiscriminately. And some of that seed falls on rocky paths and it doesn't grow. Others of it grows on thorny or soil filled with weeds and it grows up a little bit but it gets choked out but some of that seed falls on fertile ground Jesus said and when it does it can reap as much as a hundred fold that's God's economy God and God alone can take a few seeds and reap a hundred fold what's been sown God alone can take a little church in Gardner Kansas 
and make a difference in the lives of people in Guatemala and Ethiopia and in downtown Kansas City and among those just struggling to get by in Gardner. Only God can do this. And he does do it, doesn't he? We've seen it. As we have opportunity. That's a prayer for every day, isn't it? Pretty sure there's going to be an opportunity tomorrow to do good. If God gives you tomorrow, I bet there's going to be an opportunity to do something good. So that's the, the final exhortation among about teachers and the taught, about sowing and reaping. That's the kind of church Paul wants them to be. But he ends with what I'm calling an invitation, a call back to once again the fundamentals of this whole letter. Picture Paul now. He takes the writing implement He's been dictating to this point. Now he takes it. Look at the large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. Are they large letters because his eyesight is bad? Maybe. Are they large letters because of emphasis? Maybe. It's because of both? <laughs> Maybe. But he takes the, the writing implement and he writes the rest of the letter. And though the word itself doesn't appear, I think the meaning is clear, that his final appeal or invitation for them is to follow him and to embrace the gospel. To be able to say what he says, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you've been in the church for a while, you've, you've probably heard a pastor or two talk about how that phrase may have kind of lost a little bit of its impact. We wear crosses. We display crosses in church. They're refined. Some are beautiful. I'm not going to go down a path of whether or not. I, I, I don't get too hung up on that. But don't let the shock value of the statement be lost on us. Paul's saying the only thing I'm going to boast about in my life is the most inglorious, indignant manner of death known in the first century. To be nailed like a common thief to a Roman cross. And Paul says, I'm going to boast in that. Now, for those who even believed in the, the value of the cross, who understood why the cross, to them, a lot would still say, I, I'm too embarrassed to boast about that. Too ashamed for that to be my boast. And Paul says, if you don't, you don't, you don't understand the gospel. This is the heart of the Christian faith. Not these external observances and rites and rituals and rules and regulations. The cross was and still is offensive in every sense of the word. But it's the heart of our faith. The heart of the faith is about the substitutional sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Because when you boast in the cross, you are at the same time saying... I needed that because I am weak and powerless to save myself. The one who allowed himself to be crucified, who could have saved himself but did not, died because I cannot save myself. That's what I believe. That's my boast. That I'm too weak and powerless to save myself. That all of the good things you could add up in my life don't amount to this much. <laughs> in the work of salvation. And at that point, you're yielding control to Jesus, the one who looked as though he was 
out of control, who, who, who people took control over him. No, he was in control. He was in control. He laid down his life. Paul's opponents were insulted at the thought of the cross representing salvation. This is what he means in chapter 5, verse 11, about the offense of the cross. They taught what they did, according to chapter 6, verse 12, to avoid persecution. Don't want anyone thinking, I'm out of my mind preaching about the value of the cross. But most telling and Paul pulls no punches here, is that those who push for circumcision, at the same time, Paul says, have no intention of keeping the rest of the law in chapter 6, verse 13. Theirs is a religion without persecution, a religion about accomplishments, a religion about appearances. Paul's boast is in the cross. His faith about the accomplished, sufficient work of Jesus and it comes with a price. But it also comes with a great reward for his final invitation to us, to them, to us, is to enjoy our freedom. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world what does that mean? I believe it's an invitation to live in freedom. A freedom that too many Christians do not enjoy. Because if I truly boast in Christ alone, there is at that point a remarkable turnaround in my life. And at that point, the world becomes dead to me. That which I strove for, that which I agonized over and, and desired, all of that becomes dead to me. It, it no longer reigns over me. I know I still live in the world and I still love people in the world, but that world has lost its grip on me. It means that the, for that, that the Christian does not need to even care. Hear me carefully here. It, it doesn't... We don't even have to care what the world thinks of us. Can I put it that way? And yet I feel so much that we care so much about what others think of us that when they think bad of us, we kind of, we lash back out and we respond in kind. Who cares what the world thinks of us? You lose your evangelistic appeal if you have that attitude. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. So the one that Paul opposed earlier in chapter 2, Peter, later in his life would write these words in 1 Peter 4, 3 and 4. You've spent enough time. He's talking to Christians. You've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. Sounds very much like the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, right? They're surprised that you don't join them in their reckless, wild living. And they heap abuse on you. Peter's next words aren't, so stick your tongue back out at them and say, you know. No. Let it be. Let it be. If the world is crucified to us and us to the world, such abuse, such reaction does not control us. We're free. The world no longer has any claim on us. The law of the spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Those were Paul's words in Romans. So we are free to be bold. We are free to be courageous. We are free to make sacrifices because we have the promise of Hebrews 13. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Remember the next phrase? What can man do to you? We're free. Amen. Folks, this is why theology and doctrine matter. 
because it alters our perspective. It changes our priorities. When we understand the cross, we understand salvation. When we understand salvation, we understand our freedom. When we understand our freedom, we, we live differently in this world. We don't get hung up in the things we used to get hung up in. As Paul was saying, in his context, it's not circumcision that counts for anything. It's not uncircumcision. It's not stuff on the externals. What, cre what matters is a new creation from the inside. And if we walk according to this rule, peace and mercy will be upon us. Who doesn't need that? From now on, let no one cause me trouble. <laughs> That's like Paul saying, I dare you. For I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. He didn't write this letter all that much after his trip to the Galatia. I wonder if he still has some welts from the stones. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. What more could he ask? Grace be with us. Get out of the rat race. Get out of the, the hamster wheel of trying to earn your relationship with God. Grace be on you. David Platt says it really well. Here's the sum and substance of a disciple. The marks of Jesus on your body, the grace of Jesus in your spirit. Now, I, I, I can tell you if I don't have physical marks on my body, from the faith, but we've, we've suffered emotional scars. You, you have suffered emotional scars for the faith. It's a mark of a disciple. With the grace of Jesus in your spirit. Last word. Amen. Let's pray. We marvel in your grace, Father. We boast in your cross. What may seem in 2,000 years later is nonsense, is the heart of our message about who we are, about who you are, about what Christ did for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.